Hello, this is uh, Brant Niehaus. I want to welcome you to the Hotel Investors Marketplace produced by Hotel Brokers International. I am president of HBI for 2015 and president of Huff Niehaus and Associates, Inc., a hotel brokerage and consulting firm located in Louisville, Kentucky. The Hotel Investors Marketplace is designed to provide today's hotel owners and investors with the most current industry information and an opportunity to preview recently listed hotels. While everyone is getting signed in and comfortable, we will highlight a few HBI members' listings on the screen, and I'll share a few um, other items. Hotel Brokers International was founded in 1959 and is the leading network of real estate brokers specializing exclusively in hotel real estate, providing every phase of the hotel brokerage process from property valuation to closing. HBI Hotel Brokerage Specialists have successfully negotiated more than 10,000 hotel real estate transactions and annually account for the greatest number market share of all select service and economy hotel sales in the United States. Visit HBI on the web at hbihotels.com. If at any time during the webcast you have a question, just click on the Ask a Question button found on the gray bar located at the top of the webcast player. Type in your question and submit. Submit it and we will answer as many of those as we have time. We want to let you know how we want you to let us know how we're doing. So rate today's webcast by clicking on the rate which is found on the gray bar located at the top of the webcast player. Later today this webcast will be posted on demand viewing at hbihotels.com. Feel free to come back to the website and view it at any time in the future. Today I have the pleasure of welcoming Dennis Nessler, Editor-at-Large of Hotel Business Magazine, Matthew Crosswy, Principal of Stonehill Tr Strategic Capital, and Eddie Burkhart, Senior Vice President of BB&T. Dennis is the editor at large for Hotel Business Magazine and has covered the lodging industry for better than 13 years of his more than 24 years of experience in the trade journalism. In his position, Dennis covers all aspects of lodging, writing, news, feature stories for the magazine, as well as items for the publication's website, hotelbusiness.com. Dennis is also a contributing editor for Hotel Business Design a sister publication of Hotel Business specializing in hotel design. Matthew Crosswy is a principal with Stonehill Strategic Capital, leading their efforts in sourcing and underwriting new credit opportunities. Prior to heading Stonehill Strategic Capital, Matthew was responsible for sourcing, negotiating, and financing hotel investment opportunities for Peachtree Hotel Group. He began his career at Greystone Financial in their CMBS group, consulting with B-Peace investors to securitize their multi-billion dollar portfolios. He later went on to join Specialty Finance Group, SFG, where at the end of his tenure with SFG, Matthew managed a $1.8 billion portfolio. Matthew earned his business administration degree in real estate finance from the University of Georgia. Eddie Burkhart, um, I do not have a complete bio on, but he has been in the lending um, uh, community for 30-plus uh, years and currently holds the title of Senior Vice President of BB&T, handling their commercial real estate loans and um, ranging from hotels to all types of commercial lending. Let's begin with uh, Dennis, um, which Dennis is the reason we sort of came up with this uh, webinar. Um, hotel Business uh, annually does a lending survey in which they conduct um, a survey with multiple uh, lenders across the, the country, and uh, we thought it would be good to find out some of the things that he learned from there and then roll that into uh, – uh, questions about uh, lending in general, and Matthew, um, who handles a lot of different financing, can can help us to uh, 
answer some of those questions. So, Dennis, um, let me ask you first. Um, uh, when you when you did the survey, um, what type of lenders did you find um, that replied? Did they range from small sure. to large um, CMBS yeah, we lenders? Have, you know, what types were they? Yeah, we uh, we have a pretty good variety of lenders from from local uh, from local lenders to to more national firms. Um, Doing every everything from permanent to financing, bridge financing, acquisition, development, um, you know, SBA, mezzanine, refinance, preferred equity, um, various different types of, of financing, uh, you know, for all these different firms. Um, were there? Um, uh, did they did they provide any indications to you as to what type of financing they're doing? Uh, yeah, they, they, I mean, that those are some of the things that each, each firm, uh, lists in the, in this survey, they list the uh, loans offered. So, um, you know, whether it's acquisition or construction or refinance or, or mezzanine or what have you, they all, uh, they all provide that information for us in the survey. Um, a couple of other things of note, uh, you know, in terms of we, there were 24 participants, uh, in the survey in total. So we have 24 different firms. Um, the number of loans, for example, uh, averaged out to 36 uh, loans per per year for uh, for 2014. That is um, for these firms. So, uh, which is up significantly from the prior years. Um, the prior years was was uh, I believe was in the the high teens range uh, two years ago, and then it crept up to the mid 20s last year. So, clearly there are more loans uh, being offered now. Um, that 36 is, I mean, it goes from a range from uh, three, which is was uh, from Mesa West Capital, um, and all the way to 120, which was Access Point Financial did 120. So, um, you know, that skews the numbers a bit, but uh, that's kind of the range that came in in, in the, the mid 30s. So, mm -hmm. um, just to give you a, a perspective of how many loans are, are, are these firms are doing, or at least did in 2014. Yeah, it sounds like an increase of 50% over 2014. Right. Or, or yeah, over 2013. In, in, in or around there, yes. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of also the size of the loans was was also significantly uh, more um, in the 20 to 25 million dollar range. Uh, again, if if we go back a few years, uh, it was it was more in the 10, 12, you know, even mid teens, uh, even going back just two years. So. Um, you know, we've seen a dramatic increase in terms of the size of the loans uh, throughout the last couple of years. Um, were there any other um, statistics that you got that were significant besides the number and and size? Um, those are the, those are the I've shared. I mean, do they provide you with any kind of terms of? Of what they're no, we we don't uh, they don't do that. We don't get into to you know kind of competitive information that might uh, they may they may not want to reveal. Um, right. It's uh, sometimes challenging to get them to reveal. In fact, some of them don't actually reveal some of their numbers in terms of loans and, and dollar volume. But um, mm -hmm. most of them, we're fortunate that most of them do. Um, so that's that's pretty much the the nuts and the bolts in terms of the uh, the, the hard data that we have from these from these firms. Okay. Um, Matthew, you've been um, over the last couple of years doing a lot of um, uh, acquisitions uh, and, and financing. Uh, so you've probably seen the trends that that you know the, those lenders reported. Um, with regards to the more recent 12 months um, or you know, 2014. Um, do you see lenders being more aggressive and, and more available? In this current uh, market, and how so? There's, there's definitely more lenders, um, a lot more, especially lenders, uh, especially. Um, in in terms of getting more aggressive, uh, you, you haven't seen the aggression that you know pre 2005 2006 from most balance sheet lenders as well as the CMBS side. Uh, mm -hmm. Both groups tend to be sticking to their fundamentals in terms of underwriting and, and you still have certain caps uh, for just a traditional or CMBS lender uh, seeing, you know, leverage pretty much capped out at 70%. If you want to go above that, you're, you know, talking with, um, you know, you're incorporating MES or, or somebody that's going to hold back a B piece. It's just um, when, when the paper goes for securitization, um, 
you know, the rating agencies as well as the BP buyers are not willing to stretch on the hotels. You also see a lot of a lot of shops underwriting um, us as well to 2012 and 2013 numbers, though there's still, you know, more term left in this current cycle. Uh, based on our belief, um, it, it's just you're, you're looking at five and ten year paper where there's eventually going to be a downturn or there's going to be a you know, major supply addition, something that's going to have a correction where the, these revenues that we're currently experiencing today are not sustainable over a ten year period. So you're, you're, you're starting to see uh, different, different uh, groups really actually learning a lesson from this most recent downturn and staying more conservative in their underwriting. Now, you know, who's to say with time, um, you know, anything can happen. Uh, right. and, and you probably will start to see, you know, people start to press. But right now, if anything else, we've only seen spreads tightening opposed to uh, groups pushing on leverage and getting more aggressive in the capital stack. Uh, that's one of the reasons we formed Stonehill going back to uh, October of 2014 when we launched our fund. Uh, it was was to be more of an intermediary as, as a bridge lender while also providing, uh, you know, being a conduit and providing uh, CMBS loans as well, uh, more transitional assets, assets that maybe uh, aren't as easily underwritable for CMBS shops or a typical balance sheet lender where you might be looking at pro formas or you need a little higher leverage or uh, some major capex or DP, whatever the story may be, um, we're one of the, I guess we'd be classified as one of the specialty lenders that can uh, get more comfortable with the actual real estate and understanding the dynamics of it. Mm-hmm. Um, for our listeners, um, uh, could you define uh, what a B piece is? Some some may not fully understand that. Yeah, and, and I guess I made two references to BPs. One being, uh, a lot of times you'll see uh, within a, within a loan, you'll have the senior mortgage lender post closing. They might have to carve off, and this is with the servicer. You know, the the the, the, the borrower doesn't see it, but behind the scenes, the A note is carved off and securitized, and the B piece of the note, the B is then held on balance sheet uh, with some equity fund uh, similar to us. Um, and then I referenced the B buyer with the B piece buyer, and that's with the CMBS securitization where the loan is carved up into a number of different tranches from triple A's, double A's, single A's, which are all priced out. And then at the very bottom of the stack, you have the B piece buyer that typically secu- buys and securitizes about 20% of the total capitalization. Um, so say you have a $1.5 billion securitization, they'll be holding 300000 or 20% of that, that stack. And based on the waterfall, it, then they're the last ones to get paid out um, because they are taking the most risk. And effectively, it's just like a, your mortgage payment is, is serving to uh, provide the distribution similar to a bond payment. Mm-hmm. Um, on... on um with the CMBS lending, is that – I mean, it was aggressive back in 06 and 07. It seemed like that's what everybody was doing. Um, are just even the individual loans you know, on an asset, whether it's a $15 million or a $50 million asset, um, are they being rolled into CMBS um, uh Programs where they end up getting sold on the bond market, or are banks holding on to them more these days? You're seeing a lot more. Just, just you're seeing a lot more of the CBS market with hotels. And one reason uh, groups don't have to reach on hotels is because there is so much volume in terms of hotel product. Uh, you've had a number of different uh, bank regulations that have come down, uh, specifically uh, with Basel III and. The ability for, uh, you know, hotels are now, there, there was some, I guess, there wasn't clarification in, t- in terms of how a hotel was classified on a on a bank's balance sheet, whether it was CRE or CNI, um, being an owner-occupied loan. Uh, so, but now that it's clearly defined as commercial real estate, it falls in the same bucket as multifamily office, retail, industrial, and then you have hotels. Banks tend to prefer, they tend to know and understand the other asset classes much better than hotels, so they're a little more reluctant, unless if the sponsorship is extremely strong, they're, they're a little more reluctant to lend on that asset class. Um, so you, you're seeing a ton of volume 
uh, moving into the CMBS markets with with hotels, uh, you're starting to see uh, the cusp of all the 2005, 2006, 2007 CMBS hotel loans that were securitized. You see those loans maturing, coupled with uh, just you know new construction deals that have finally ramped from you know 2007, 2008. Uh, so you see it. You really are seeing a lot of product. And the CMBS side is very healthy with that, and they have they have certain caps within their securitizations. It's about 10 to 15 percent of of the pool can be uh, hotels. So you ha- you have caps within the securitizations, which is limiting the amount of hotel product in any given securitization. Coupled with all the supply that needs to be for refinance, and then a regional uh, community bank's balance sheet being less less reluctant to provide hospitality loans. So. That's that's also why you see you know that's why one reason you see the volume of the CMBS that's one reason you see the underwriting criteria staying pretty pretty uh, disciplined and then that's the other reason why you're seeing a lot of specialty finance shops uh, pop up. Um, you mentioned um, the CMBS loans of oh five six and seven. I'm sure those are ten year loans, so they're now coming due and being refinanced. Are most of those do most of those get rolled into another CMBS loan? Uh, not typically. Um, yeah, what happens we're, to them we're, then? we're actually working on two right now. One that we should close in the next two weeks, where it's it's a maturing loan. But what you what you're dealing with now, you know, it paid, it performed, everything works. But you have a lot of capex that's required at the hotel so that they can get the extended license. A lot of guys maybe don't want to work with a special servicer on the CBS side in, in terms of uh, getting the distributable cash flow or the dis- distributions. For those capex items, it could be anywhere from, as we know, probably one and a half to three million dollars, uh, depending on the deal size. Even north of that, so uh, you know we're doing it as a bridge loan, as a floating rate bridge loan that rolls into a permanent loan in 18 to 24 months. Our typical term is 36 months, so we can we can basically provide the bridge and then roll straight into a perm loan once um, you know they, they've completed the, the, the required PIP, they have the extended license, and they've ramped up their NOI to a level that sizes for a CMBS loan. Is, is this lending um, that you do, is it direct um, from a, a source, or are you like a broker um, doing No, we're, we're, we're direct in everything we do from the bridge loans to the CMBS loans. Uh, we closed on – we have a debt fund that we closed, again, last, last October, and then we're out raising our second fund uh, in the next uh, 60 days. We're, we're, we're about to start ramping that up as well. And, and there's a number of firms across the country that, that do what you do, raise money and then, you know, um, uh, find places to put it. Um, in general, what are the terms uh, on a, you know, typical – you know, select service uh, product. And, and the reason I'm trying to focus on select service or mention that is the majority of our our customer base probably is the, the limited service, select service kind of product. Um, we, we can talk about full service later, um, but let's focus on that for the moment, the select service. So what would they find in that? Yeah, definitely. For, for our floater, for our floating rate loans, um, we're typically pricing them depending on the leverage. If we're closer to 70 percent, <laughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. If we're closer to 70 percent loan to value, loan to cost, then we're going to be around floating around 6 percent plus or minus 25 to 50 bips. If we're going up in the stack, up to close to 80, 85 percent loan to value, loan to cost, then um, we're probably about 100. 50 bips wider, probably closer to seven and a half, eight percent. That's that's us as a private lender. If you talk with the BBTs and the balance sheet lenders of the world, they're probably uh, 100 bips, 150 bips tighter um, than us. But you know, all our loans are typically non-recourse. If you're going, if you're looking at the permanent world in terms of going uh, CMBS, then you're looking at spreads are typically right now anywhere from you know, around 200 to uh, 235 over, and this is all select service. Uh, and then for the 10-year, and the 10-year uh, swaps is currently about 247. So your all-in rate is anywhere from 4.5 to call it, uh, you know, a little under 5%. And then five-year is probably 275 to 300 over, and current five-year swaps is right around 180. 
Okay. Um, thank you for mentioning BB&T. I think Eddie's um, gotten on the line. Uh, welcome, Eddie. Yes. I, uh, again, I apologize. We had okay. a situation with the client, and uh, unfortunately, clients come first, so I apologize that's right. for some um, late. <laughs> yeah. Um, are you on a speakerphone? Uh, yes, I am. If you Would could, you like to uh, yeah, pick up on the handset. It'll record better. Okay. I, I did that. I apologize. Yeah, that's okay. No problem. Uh, we've been just talking here with uh, Matthew Crosswhy, um, who is with uh, Stonehill Strategic Capital in Atlanta, and um, uh, primarily talking about the CB CMBS market and, and some of the you know financing that's going on there. And we just were talking about um, for a um, select service kind of product, uh, limited service, um, the, the kind of financing that he's seen, um, whether it's 70 percent loan to value or 80 to 85. Um, maybe you could talk to us in terms of, in general, what the regional banks are looking at these days that, you know, um, BB&T falls into uh, that will finance in, in more than just their backyard. Okay. Well, the the key with BB&T, and I'm sure with a lot of the regional banks, I mean, uh, the way we look at the hotel, the hospitality financing is, we're uh, BB&T is uh, we'd like to grow that portfolio. When I say that, with with proven operators and the right flag as well, and the location is is with real estate, whether it be hospitality or anything. Of course, it's location, location, location. But you throw in uh, with the hotel especially, it's going to be the flag as well as the quality of operator. I mean, our typical financing, the, we had just recently changed, uh, which, which is very beneficial to the client, amortization. Historically, BB&T and a lot of the regional banks would put in uh, with hotel financing, you would be looking at a 20-year amortization. We just mm -hmm. recently changed our policy to where we can now go to 25 years, which which is still it makes it a little bit more competitive with the permanent market, but as the gentleman mentioned before me, the non-recourse factor is definitely makes the the permanent market a more advantageous if that's what you're looking for. We uh, if it's a full service hotel, we're typically in the 75% loan to value, loan to cost. Of course, with that we always go with the lesser of the two. So most of the time the loan to cost factor. So we're usually with appraised value depending on. Uh, uh, many factors is usually a little less than that, but I mean we typically require 25% uh, equity into the deal, and that's up front. The equity can be, you know, true cash. You know, we'll give we'll give the developer fee if it's a construction loan. We'll give uh, up to 5% for a developer fee as well as if they own the land, uh, we can count that as well too. I mean amortization if it's a new hotel, as we talked about. Whether it's construction uh, or the mini perm, we can go 25 year, 25 years. If it's an older hotel and looking at the franchise agreement, I mean we can we can definitely go 20. Uh, the pricing that we typically see, again, depending on of course the uh, the you know, on the debt service coverage, but the pricing we're anywhere from LIBOR 200 floating to LIBOR 250, um, a little bit higher uh, on that, maybe closer to perhaps 275 to 3 on some of the, the limited uh, service hotels. But uh, BB&T, uh, we're, we're pretty excited about about with the right clients. We, we we're back into the market of uh, the hospitality financing. Uh, we just recently, and when I say recently, back in uh, December, we financed a couple of hotels. Uh, one was in uh, Auburn Hills, Michigan, and one was in Tallahassee. So if it's a proven operator, we will follow them throughout the uh, the continental United States. Mm -hmm. um, uh, with uh, the existing, um, uh, well, let's let's stick with it. Sound like new construction is where you okay. can go to the 25 year. Because um, uh, when you say 25 year and then you throw in the franchisors, m most of them 20 years is about the max that you get on a franchise agreement. Does that still Correct. allow you to, you know, go to that 25-year amortization, or? It does. It absolutely does. I mean, uh, if we were looking, uh, as you said, on the new construction, we definitely can go 25 years. And if it's an existing, uh, if it's an existing one as well, too, provided the franchise agreement isn't less than five years, 
like you said, typically you see 20 years, even if it's even if it's 10 years remaining, if it's a if it's a newer one with if the NOI looks really good and the occupancy level and the quality of the operator, we can still offer the 25 year amortization. But a lot of those, I mean, as you as you well mentioned, depending on the franchise agreement and and the age of the hotel so far, I mean, we can 20 is 20 is definitely uh, kind of the rule of thumb, but uh, 25 we can definitely go to 25 as well. Well, and that's just an amortization. I mean, you probably Correct. have a term in there um, that Absolutely. allows you to, you know, readjust. Is that a five or ten year term, or does that depend on whether it's new construction or? Well, you know, it it thing. does. It depends on new construction. I mean, we can. I mean, we can go as as long as ten years on the uh, whether it be during the construction, the lease up, as well as kicking into the mini perm. The typical what we see is right around seven years. What a lot of our clients like to do as well is once we have it built, of course, and going through their lease up, and usually, you know, in their third year projections, they start hitting that. So that's usually, you know, anywhere from five to seven years. Then that's when we get, that's when we talk to uh, BB&T, a wholly owned subsidiary, is, is Grandbridge. We work with the client to get them, to take them to the permanent market so they can get the non-recourse financing. Of course, they get the long amortization as well, too. And depending on their, uh, depending on the project, and of course how it's performing, a lot of times when they refinance it in the permanent market, they can, they can, they can get back the equity that they originally put into it during the construction part of it. Um, Matthew, um, with regards to the financing you're doing, is it uh, um, all on existing, or have you done any new construction? And I, I know new construction is a little off for our owners. Um, and investors, uh, typically we're dealing with existing um, uh, real estate, but most of the those who own existing real estate also do some development along the way. So that's why I'm asking these questions about new construction. Um, have you have you guys done any of that new construction, or is it primarily acquiring assets? Uh, speaking to the debt side. Yeah, to the debt side. Purely, yeah, it's been, it's been mostly 100% of what we financed so far has been new construction, major value add, renovations, um, repositions. That's been the majority of, uh, of what we've done. Uh, we are actually, we just apped our first two new construction deals, but it's going to be more the form of MAS and PREF equity taking the leverage up to 90, 95, 95% of uh, project costs, almost more like JV equity. So on the ones that are not new construction, um, is it um, uh, lending done under acquisition versus refinance? Uh, how how is that broken up for you guys? In terms of new acquisitions, it's it's probably fifty fifty. Fifty fifty, yeah. Um, uh, from BB and T standpoint, um, it probably doesn't matter. Uh, whether it's new, I mean, whether it's a, a refinancing or an acquisition, uh, does it, Eddie? No, it doesn't. No, it does not. I mean, the only thing with, of course, with the acquisition, of course, we would be sticking to the uh, to the loan to cost factor. But if it's refinancing, that wouldn't really play into it. We would base that off the loan to value. And when you say loan to cost, um, if somebody's buying an asset for, uh, you know, seven million dollars and it needs to you know, 1.2 million to sort of reposition it, or even just improve it in its same same brand. Um, you would add that 1.2 to the purchase price to get to the yep. total cost. That is correct. Yes, okay. that is correct. Um, th is is that the way it works with the uh, larger assets that you see, Matthew? Do, yep, are those right. renovations rolled into the you know, a loan to cost versus just loan? Uh, on the acquisition, it, it's well, really for the acquisition. That's the only way we can look at the loan to cost. We, uh, you know, if if it's a maturing loan, and, and then the, then we have to capitalize the the tip. Um, we don't look as much as at the cost. We're looking at trades in the market. We're looking at how that market performed during the downturn. What were the factors that led to? You know, maybe some deterioration in performance in that downturn. Has that been uh, mitigated with the market itself through new major demand drivers? That there's a, a number of items that we look at to come up with what we think that asset's worth today, coupled with then pairing that with the tip dollars 
and that's kind of how we back into it's really low to value. So as long as, as uh, when you say loan to value, um, uh, do you look at an appraisal that's based on the af after renovation um, to get a value yeah. or is it current market? We're looking if if we are we're looking at after completion of the renovation. And we do order appraisals, but uh, you know we're very active in the market, both on the real estate and debt side. So we really take our our, our pulse in, ter in terms of what we think the valuation is. The the appraisals more just for confirmation and for our credit files. Okay. Um, and speaking of appraisals. Um, uh, let me. I'll, I'll throw it out to Eddie first, and and then you can make comment, Matthew. Um, um, is there any um, issues on appraisals these days? Uh, I've had some some people say that they've run into, you know, with the growing values that we see. Sometimes appraisals, when they start looking at, you know, past histories and comps, and and that it it, it has a tendency to sort of drag. Um, have you run into any issues, or what type of issues have you run into in that regard, Eddie, on on loans? Um, well, I, th I think uh, I think that's a good point. A lot of times, uh, it makes it a little tougher from the standpoint if you're if you have a you have a new operator acquiring a hotel that hasn't performed as well as it has in the past. So that's something that uh, the appraisers have typically what we've seen. They're, they tend to be a little bit more conservative from the standpoint. I mean, uh, so that's one of the things that we work with with the appraiser to help uh, to look at the clients, look at their proven track record as well as some of their projections and make sure that they're realistic, showing that, okay, the property previously may have been mismanaged poorly. So here's, here's a proven operator, you know, a very similar product. Here's what they're basically been able to get the occupancy up. Here's what their ADR is. Here's what the NOI they historically have been able to achieve. So uh, we have, uh, I mean, the appraisers typically uh, seems like in the good times they, they tend to appraise it too high, and in the bad times they tend to appraise it a little too low. So uh, we have to typically work with the appraiser a little bit to get the uh, to get the appropriate rate there. So, uh, I mean, if you talk to the clients, they're always going to say that the appraisers are way too conservative. So, but right. we have to, we have to, we definitely have to work with them on the projections. If it's a proven uh, operator, you know, it helps out the situation. But uh, if it's a newly, uh, if it's someone new to the hotel, then it's going to be probably, it's going to be a really conservative appraisal. Does that kind of answer the question? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and Matthew, you, as you said, you don't really rely on appraisals for most of what you do in the debt. Yeah, they, they have to check the box at the end of the day, but we think we're probably just as, if not more conservative than the appraisal, and I'd say Eddie's pretty much spot on. It, it's 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 when you have an asset that's being bought out of receivership or, or, or some story where maybe maybe the manager's in there knowing that they're just babysitting the hotel, uh, knowing that they're only going to be in there for a year or two. Uh, there are a lot of uh, special circumstances where you can really get comfortable underwriting kind of more pro forma numbers um, from a good sponsor. And so Eddie, Eddie, Eddie's pretty spot on there. Okay. Um, Eddie, uh, I know BB&T uh, on some of the uh, deals that, that fall into the, the proper category, um, it does work with SBA and the CDCs on those $5 million and smaller uh, projects. Um, uh, anything in particular going on there that you know uh, works well for BB and T, or what kind of situation works well for you on on those? Well, I mean, a lot of times, I mean, typically, we, if it's a if it's someone that if the the property itself isn't, uh, we, we really can't get comfortable with. Of course, having an SBA loan definitely helps the situation. That sure ups any gaps that we have. The uh, the only uh, thing that I I would mention to anyone if they're looking at an SBS SBA loan is the standpoint with the paperwork and the timing. Uh, give yourself uh, if you're uh, if you're looking at purchasing a hotel from someone, make sure you give yourself ample time because it it's always taking a little bit longer than than what it should. Just going through the the regulations and the paperwork, it tends to take a little bit more, but uh, but no, I mean we uh, we 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 don't see it as much probably. Uh, maybe it's the uh, maybe it's the clients that we've been looking at it. I mean, 
I think Brant just recently closed or helped close a loan that we did in Owensboro that, I mean, it turned out extremely well, but unfortunately, uh, from the client standpoint, and of course, the bank, it, it, it took a little longer than we want. We, uh, as we tell our clients, we definitely want to close it as soon as possible because as soon as we get it on the books, then we can start charging interest and that's how we make our money off of it. Right. But, uh, right. but I would just, I would just say, uh, I would just give, I would just, let the people know to make sure that they give themselves ample time, that it's going to take a little bit longer than what they first anticipated. Yeah, our experience on that one was one in which it was uh, you know, probably at least 90 days, and then we may have had to have one extension on that uh, to to get the final. It wasn't because BB&T hadn't approved it. We were waiting for something on the SBA side. So um, uh, that is a good point. Um, it's hard to contract, uh, put a, a contract in and say you need 120 days to close. Uh, so it's probably better to have 90 and uh, and just know that you might need some extra time. Um, do you, Matt, do you get involved in any kind of government uh, subsidized financing like the SBA programs or any other kind? No, we don't. Um... I, mean, I try to stay that free entrepreneurial spirit, right? <laughs> That's right. We, I mean, we've had guys call us and we're willing to do it to provide some short-term bridge loans. If they have to go hard and, you know, an auction.com or have to close within 30, 60 days, we'll help facilitate that short-term, um, you know, three- to six-month bridge loan, uh, knowing that the SBA loan is going to take a little longer to close. Okay. So, so you provide that kind of service, which would be just the uh, bridge financing on a – probably less than a year kind of, almost like a construction loan type term. So right. And, and, well, well, yeah, and, and, and an SBA loan will be an even shorter. Our, our typical bridge loan is three years with two one-year extensions. The SBA loan is just completely different. You know your takeout is okay. going to be SBA going in. You just need somebody that's really just going to be there for two, maybe maybe four to five months. Um, okay. That's the theory. They just want certainty of execution. What kind of uh, terms come with that kind of uh, short-term bridge? It's obviously it's a little Is more it? expensive, just given that, that you know we're you know put, doing a lot of work to hold a load on our books, as Eddie mentioned. For very short uh, we, time. We, we, we make money. We make money through uh, interest payments, right? And if it's only on our books for four months, that's a lot of work for not much interest. Uh, so it's it's. So what kind of premium does somebody in general, you don't have to give me any specifics, but, I mean, just in general, is that, you know, before we were talking about 200 basis, does it become a 500 basis kind of, uh, you know? In, in terms of how wider, how yeah, wider how wide. it is, it's, I mean, we'd probably be in the 8 to 10 percent range with, with uh, you know, and then fees mm-hmm. going in and out. Yeah. Um, it's just it's it's just a lot of work for such a short term loan. And, well, you know, and you know it's not for everybody. Some people understand that they they want the certainty of execution. Other guys just you know it's too and, and that's not our bread and butter. It's really we do it for um, we, we've done it in the past for guys that you know we have a great relationship with that just need a favor. Okay, okay. Um, uh, Dennis, um, I know that there was there's a. Article coming out in July on um, uh, the economy brand uh, hotels and and how um, uh, larger investors could or you know it, 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 the discussion was about how larger investors could become involved in economy brands. Um, mm-hmm. are, are you privileged to any of that article? I don't yeah. know if you were involved on it or not. Um, I'm just um, curious, uh, a result out of that, did, did anything come up that talked about um, financing for the economy brands? Uh, and, and yeah, I mean, doing? yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, one of the things that we've seen, you know, and, and, you know, as you guys all can attest to, is that the select service, you know, more of the upscale select service category has been really hot for, for the last several years. Um and from an investment standpoint, it seems to be that the thing that, that everyone is primarily interested in investing in, um, the returns have been great in that in that segment, and uh, you know the financing has, has been pretty uh, easy to obtain. In terms of if economy um, properties, um, it's been more challenging, but 
the economy sector has actually done fairly well, uh, as as all of them have um, for the last you know couple of years. But I think it's it's actually outpaced some of the other uh, segments, uh, mid scale and, and what have you. So um, we're seeing a little bit more interest in terms of you know from the lender perspective in terms of economy properties. Um, there's been some some changes in terms of some of the brands uh, changing. You know whether it's changing names and logos and, and kind of trying to reposition themselves and, and also offering newer, uh, more different prototypes and, and uh, more modern product, trying to add some amenities um, and kind of step it up a little bit closer to, to the mid-scale level. Um, so through that, we've seen a little bit more interest, and in, I think in general just because uh, there's a little more uh, – Performance has been greater throughout the industry. I think you've seen more interest uh, from lenders in general. So um, the competition has gotten a little bit has increased, but uh, you know it still lags way behind the select service sector, as as you guys know, and upscale. Um, but th there is there is some interest and there is an opportunity, and and we're seeing more new construction in that sector too. I think than than some of the other ones. Um. Talking about competition, one thing I thought of earlier, and, and Eddie, Eddie, you made reference to Grambridge being uh, part of, or you, BB and T being part of Grambridge. Um, can you explain to me a little more about that? Because I'm wondering if Gran, is Grambridge, is that a similar kind of entity as is Stonehill Strategic Capital? Um, yes, yes, it is. I mean, uh, Grambridge is a wholly owned subsidiary of BB&T, and what we work with them, basically when we have a client that is looking for uh, for the non-recourse financing, you know, BB&T, we are a recourse lender, but, I mean, it's an arm. They'll take it to the uh, – they'll go out to the permanent market. They'll call some of their uh, – the people where it's Danny, Freddie, HUD, you know, whomever they want to deal with, and they're able to offer the client uh, the uh, non-recourse financing from that standpoint. And, and, um, and just to be it, clear, we, we we do do everything on our balance sheet. So, from the conduit loan, we'll close it, sell it. You're, you're close. We're underwriting. We're running the legal process. Same thing with our bridge loan. So, um, that's I guess where we might be a little different. You're just right. interacting with with uh, with Stonehill, but that's all we do is exclusively hotels. Uh, Grand Bridges, they represent as, as a correspondent for life companies, uh, CMBS shops, bridge lenders. Um, they'll go to market to service maybe what your particular need is. We try to offer that all in-house on our balance sheet. Right, and that's because Stonehill does strictly hotel. Exactly. Lending, right? Yeah. All right, and we're Grand Bridge. They will, whether it's industrial, retail, you know, hospitality, I mean, they they focus on the whole entire commercial real estate. Commercial real estate, spectrum. right. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, and, and from your perspective, Eddie, I didn't really – give a, a big bio, but um, are you involved in, in all commercial, or are you focused on the hotel? Um, no, I'm, I'm focused on uh, – I've been in uh, banking for uh, 24 years. I started off uh, with, uh, with Bank One slash Chase for 15 years. The last nine years I've been with BB&T. Uh, no, my role is I'm head of the state of Kentucky and southern Indiana for BB&T, and my uh, – my calling, I guess, is it's hospitality. If it's any commercial real estate at BB&T, they, uh, they require me to uh, either service it, become the account officer, or, her, or work with some of our, our other lenders, whether they're being C&I or, or real estate, to help them, uh, help them to underwrite, to structure the deal for BB&T. So uh, I, we, love, we love the hospitality, but, I mean, we love the credit tenant, whether it be uh, – Industrial, whether it be retail, whether it be uh, office, you name it. I mean, single family to a point. I mean, we uh, we you know it's very selective there. You know, the A and D, of course, is is pretty uh, a specialty all to itself. I look at uh, income producing. Uh, I'm, I'm more fond of income producing as opposed to single family, but we we definitely look at that as well. Um, uh, just to get a handle on you know what. BB&T as a regional bank does, um, do they focus on the markets where they have branches or um, as a big regional bank, uh, are you able to, to extend farther beyond than where your your, uh, pro your um, bank branches are? 
Uh, I mean, yes, to answer your question, yes on both of it. We basically, I mean, in Kentucky, whether it be any of the footprint in BB&T, if the, if the client is in Kentucky, so to speak, say they're in Lexington, Kentucky, I mean, we can follow them throughout the continental United States. Uh, if they're, if the client is a prospect but they're not in one of our footprints, unfortunately, if they're doing the project in one of our footprints, we could, we can definitely look at financing. But if, say, the client, BB&T, we'll use the example, uh, we're not, we're not, we're, we're right now, we're not in, uh, New York. So if a client is, from New York and they're doing a project, say, in New York, that would be something, unfortunately, we could not do it because we don't have a presence there or, or the knowledge of the market. As we all know, your 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 toughest lending, of course, is, uh, is out of market, especially if you don't have a presence there. It's really hard to understand that market. And, and in principle, that's the way most regional banks approach it, is it not? Yes, that is correct. I mean, uh, when I was at Bank One Chase, that was very – they were very similar to that as well, too. I mean, fortunately, they were – with Chase, they were in quite a few more states and areas than, sure. than BB&T. But, uh, but, yeah, typically, whether it be U.S. Bank and PNC, any of your top ten banks, that's typically the way they look at it. They may be – there may be a few that look at it a little different, and, of course, your state banks, community banks, they typically stay within that state, so they really can't follow the client outside of their state. Um, uh, Matt, on, on Stonehill Strategic uh, Capital, um, you have customers uh, besides your friendly face at Peachtree Hotel Group, right? I mean, you're, you're dealing with all kind of – Owners and operators uh, across the country. Is, is that yeah, correct? Yeah, we, we, we have loans all over the country. Um, we actually uh, Stone Hill cannot lend to Peachtree Hotel Group. Um, th- th- there's a material conflict there, so everything we do is all has to be a third party. Okay. And unaffiliated with us. Um, and in in your arena, uh, how many other Companies do what you do around the country. Specifically, hospitality. I mean, you're, you're seeing more and more pop up, but none that are really specifically hospitality. Mm-hmm. Um, you have the latter capitals of the world. Uh, you have latitude that's out on the west coast. Um, and I'm just thinking pure. And, and, and then you have Oryx. You have a number of different groups, but they focus on all asset classes, whereas we strictly focus on hotels and just trying to develop that reputation for, uh, you know, not only being able to originate and price a credit, you know, appropriately, but also, you know, we execute 99.9% of the time based on, you know, how we originally quoted and put together that term sheet, whereas a lot of these other groups that maybe might, might not be as familiar with the, the particular um, asset class being hospitality, where, you know, they might have to go back into credit, um, have some sort of retrade or repricing on the rate, or whatever the case may be. So that's really where we're trying to focus, you know, our, our power is just on that specific niche, uh, which, which we think we know uh, better than uh, most of the other private lenders out there. Um, here's a que- one question that came in. Um, what, what are typical origination fees for a standard hotel transaction? And I don't know if there's really a standard hotel transaction these days, but... Um, could each of you sort of address that in okay. whatever fashion you feel comfortable? <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I think you made an excellent point. Uh, a typical, ma- I would say in general, uh, the hotel financing that we look at historically, I mean, it could be, it can be better, it can be worse, but I would say a good rule of thumb for for BB and T when we're looking at a hospitality financing, we typically charge. For the construction and the mini term, an upfront origination fee of a half a point. And then on our side, if if, if we're doing a permanent loan, uh, we don't charge yeah. any fees, uh, so that's zero. Um, and then if we're doing a bridge loan, um, we're typically trying to net between the origination and the exit fee about two points. And we'll typically also waive the exit fee if if we end up providing the permanent loan. So it's you know you can you can gross in terms of being the or net out in terms of being the, the borrower anywhere between one to one and a half points with us. 
Mm-hmm. On the bridge side, again, on the CBS side, it's all pretty standard. There are no fees associated with that. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, I don't know. Um, any Anything you want to share, Eddie? I'll, I'll go round the horn here. Um, Eddie, anything you want to share uh, that you think I may have missed that um, you'd like to add before we close? No, I think you did an excellent job. I would I would just say to uh, the people on the on the webcast is just whether it be if you're looking at conventional or your permanent, just feel free to uh, to give either one of us a call. We can talk to you. Or a lot of times, I just like to uh, let the clients know if they're if they're looking and they have a proposal from from the institution, it's always good to get a second opinion. Of course, my boss would probably kill me for saying that, but it's always good to, a lot of times, I've, I've many times I have talked to uh, different clients that we're not proposing it just to help them to understand some of it, to say the structure and the deal that, uh, that that particular lender is looking to you, you know, it makes perfect sense. It's a, uh, it's very, uh, it's a, uh, it's a good deal for you to take. So a lot of times it's always good to get a second opinion. It it always makes me feel good when somebody tells me that, you know, the transaction you did, it makes total sense to me and it it's it's a it makes perfect sense for you to do it that way. So mm-hmm. Matthew, anything you want to add? No, I mean I mean it's it's a pretty similar take. We're happy to look at review any and every deal and you know, know what quotes you have on the table, and, and it's really just about the best execution and the certainty of execution, um, you know, because they're real dollars at stake, and timing is, is also cost money. So, um, and, and again, we, we know the lenders and the shops and the private shops and, and who really is executing today and, and who will live by that quote. And I, I think, you know, bb and is one of those on, on, our, on our equity side. We, we have a couple loans with bb and We're and we're looking to uh, start doing more business with them. And it's a great shop, and there are a number of others here in Georgia, both community, regional, and different national banks. You just have to pair yourself with the right lender for the right project, and uh, just understanding what that long-term business goal is, it, you know, you, you just have to get their right debt. Mm-hmm. Dennis, you're the guy who usually is asking all the questions. Uh, <laughs> uh, do you have Do you have any that you've thought of while I've been talking here with Eddie? Oh, uh, <laughs> you know, here for the last um, few minutes? No, I, I think you did a great job, by the way, moderating. And um, yeah, I mean, the only thing that I would say, is, you know, I've, I, as again, I've one of the things I've heard from many of the conferences that I've gone to, including the Help Conference in Boston in, in April, is just that there's a lot more competition among lenders, um, the ability to get better terms right now, uh, different forms of lending, and I'm sure you guys, you know, are familiar with crowdfunding, which seems to be becoming, a, a, you know, enormously popular now. And I know some of the rules have changed with that, and you know people being accredited and things like that. So uh, it's an inter- interesting time in, in the, uh, for the industry and, and an interesting time for lenders right now. Um, but, it, you know, it's, it's also a good time. And, uh, you know, the, the transaction seems to just continue, continue to increase and the appetite for uh, hotel investment seems to continue to increase. So it's, it's, it's a pretty good time to be in the industry and to be a lender. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it very much, gentlemen, for, for joining us. Um, uh, again, we had uh, Dennis Nessler, the editor at large for Hotel Business Magazine, uh, Matthew Crosswy, uh, principal at Stonehill Strategic Capital, and Eddie Burkhart, senior vice president of BB&T. Um, don't forget to rate us today um, on the webcast. Click on that rate button, and uh, you'll find on the gray bar located at the top, and just let us know how how you enjoyed this um uh, panel discussion, and uh, you can download a PDF list of today's featured hotel listings uh, plus a selection of other hotel investment assets that are on the HBI um, website and listed by HBI brokers uh, by going to the website. Uh, you can click on it at the top of the webcast as well. Um, and as a reminder, this and previous Hotel Investor Marketplace webcasts are available on demand viewing online at hbihotels.com. Uh, uh, the most recent one we had earlier this year was with Mark Woodworth of uh, PKF. Um, good information um, uh, on where things are trending in the hotel uh, business for the next, uh, well, at least for the balance of the year anyway. 
Um, I'd also like to remind you uh, a couple events uh, that uh, HBI is participating in. We will uh, be a supporter of the Hotel Investment Conference in Europe held in London uh, September 28th and 29th, and uh, we'll also be exhibiting at the uh, Intercontinental Hotels Group Conference and Trade Show in San Francisco September 30th and October 2nd. So if you attended any of those, uh, please look us up. Um, again, thank you for attending, and uh, we wish everybody to have a great day. Thank you.